to do a goth look for talking about Aries, and then I did too much and was not done in time. It's fine. Clarice would like your makeup. <laughs> so, yeah, how are you doing? That's whatever. It's fine for now, I guess. <laughs> this is the best we can do, right? This is not even though this is the problem when you start doing these super complicated looks is that you go with the game of are they even and they almost never are. <laughs> At some point you just accept it. I'm impressed that you guys that you can even do this stuff because I can't even think about it. <laughs> it's just a different art It's a different canvas. Mm -hmm. I'm just intimidated because it's on my face. Yeah. yeah. So, um, we were going to talk children of Aries and I, I mean, like, so I want to acknowledge that I'm making a jump before I even start because, um, with Aries, the two children that are like his most known children are Deimos and Phobos, which are fear and dread. And they are the ones who ride into battle with him. There are other battle emotions, though, that are like kind of personified into gods, um, like war cry and um, uproar, confusion, that just, um, to me, they make sense as Aries children, but it's not ever explicitly said. Okay. And yeah, so like riding into battle with fear and dread right away, I think is it. It's that feeling that um, certain people get in like the Iliad when Achilles is on the battlefield. Like they recognize his armor right away and they're like, oh shit, it's that dude. I'm gonna have to fight that dude. Um, that's what I see Ares riding in with fear and dread being about. So when they write, when he rides in with those things, he makes other people feel those emotions? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that is that's interesting. Awesome. He would really like that. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Like, because when I was talking to my brother about this yesterday, his thinking was that, like, you feel those things when you're in the middle of a fight, which is true, too. But I would think you would rather be the person inspiring those feelings than you would be, you know, the person feeling those things. <laughs> that would definitely be way better. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, like, Mostly Aries children make sense as agents of chaos or agents of warfare, but the one that doesn't make sense, his, one of his children that we know is his child, is with Aphrodite, he had Harmonia. And so that's kind of the one where it's like, okay, is it harmony after warfare? Is it like, is it political harmony? I don't, I don't know what the idea is supposed to be behind that being one of his children. Or does Ares feel harmony when he's in warfare? I mean, that could be true too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that Western people have always had this idea that when they go to war, they are bringing peace somehow. They're bringing like their democracy or their, you know, it's like how the Fire Nation describes it in an avatar. Like, we have all this prosperity, let's share it with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm wondering if that's the idea, because that feels very, at least Roman, you know? And it feels very Aries, at least yeah. the Percy Jackson version of Aries, he would think that. Like, he would think, I'm solving all of your problems, you're welcome. <laughs> by whatever it was he wanted to do yeah i mean i think he does love chaos in percy jackson that's why he goes with chronos's plan to begin with is just there's things have been boring too long let's shake it up a little bit guys yeah yeah him um fighting on twitter is too accurate <laughs> yeah it would totally be one of the like Twitter bros. I feel like he would be one of the bros defending that dad that recently had the breakdancing dad who like is in love with Twitter and Bitcoin and stuff. <laughs> he 
he probably would have told the dad to like leave and do break dancing just to just to start that ridiculous fight <laughs> Like, your kids will love you more because you're this famous break dancer. That's how love works, obviously. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, was, that was my dad's problem. He should have done break dancing more. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't be angry while you're spitting on your head. <laughs> oh my god, that's the funniest image I've ever had. Imagine him being mad while also break dancing. <laughs> he would find a way. <laughs> yeah so it's and it's interesting too so Aries is a dad I know you were talking about Clarice getting pressured to do a uh, quest by herself even though it's typically done in threes um yeah that I feel like you know you have to extrapolate a lot with these gods and how they would be as parents because we don't see that play out ever you know they don't have a hand in raising these kids in the myths and the kids don't really seem to care because we don't have like an account of what everybody feels in that way and yeah i i i love required in choices but to be honest i don't i don't remember this one particularly with clarice um it's in sea of monsters and which is like the next season but it's somebody basically kicks Chiron out of his position at camp and that person is I forget how but he's somehow like friendly with Aries and those kids and so he picks her to go on the quest to like get the golden fleece back which is like the general story of that season and um and Aries shows up and tells her you have to go alone to basically prove like how good you are and how much of an Aries daughter you are because you're she's like the camp counselor of that cabin and like the head person and so he makes her go by herself and then Percy and Annabeth end up helping her helping I say helping in quotation marks because she's really mad about it <laughs> like but they do help actually help her and try to help her like besides some of the stuff she does to like blow things up in her face and make things more difficult than they have to be but that's like the general plot like ish of the second book to kind of start with is them going basically going after like Clarice or like yeah to knowing that her her quest there's no way that you can do that by yourself yeah if, if Percy was by himself he would have died in New Jersey <laughs> Yeah. And during their first season. And so it's ridiculous that her dad expects her to be able to do something like that by herself. Well, he wants to be able to one up Percy. That's what we're getting here. And I know like Aries, the astrological sign is not Aries, like the God of War, but you see that with Aries people sometimes this like competition that's just there. I can think of two times where it's happened with an Aries sign where like, um, one time it was decorating onesies and like we were all sitting around and decorating onesies at a baby shower and I was doing this whole Harry Potter themed thing because I knew me and the person whose baby it was like Harry Potter and just kept decorating as people went on with the party and you could see the Aries people just like looking at my my thing and like should i keep going should i keep decorating <laughs> like i feel like i need to keep decorating <laughs> and um the other time was uh my friend's birthday party we were we were doing these like they're supposed to be geodes that look like vaginas <laughs> um and she kept painting because i kept painting <laughs> uh I, yeah. I will say as an aries moon we we see everything as a competition and that can be a bad thing, obviously. I mean, my aforementioned father had six Aries placements. Oh, gosh. Including an Aries son and, like, five other ones, and which explains so much about him. When I saw that, I started laughing because I was like, of course you do. But the, the good side of that is that it, like, is the thing that keeps us motivated is mm -hmm. the idea of, like, winning even when people don't think it's a competition. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say that the Aries version... And Percy Jackson is the, I guess, the kind of unhealthy side or whatever. Like, every every Zodiac sign has, like, 
you know, good parts and bad parts like every everybody does. And he's kind of the personification of the worst parts of Aries, of you have to dominate and win, even if it means that you make everybody else feel horrible or yeah. or just expect people to do things that they absolutely can. I think it's one of those things that I think is funny is that Rick Riordan has an Aries moon and Percy is such an Aries moon. Like he is he's is exactly how we are. Like he doesn't want to be in charge he just kind of ends up having to do it because nobody else will do it, but he doesn't want to do it. Like if somebody else did it, he'd be like, that's fine. Goodbye. <laughs> but, yeah. just end up, but people think that he wants to. And so they hold all these things against him. And I think it's funny that the creator of the series has an Aries moon and wrote his hero having basically those traits and actual Aries. He absolutely despises. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I love and hate this thing about myself. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the choice to make Ares in the show, this, like, biker dude, it's, I mean, we don't have a modern equivalent, and I think that that's what's wrong with men today, is they don't really have an outlet for these, like, these tendencies to want to fight, to want to hunt, kill, you know, like, or even just masculine people, because that... It's almost like Greek mythology acknowledges that existed in the existence of Artemis and Athena, where you have Artemis being a little huntress and you have Athena being a girl who wants to dress in armor and go to war. You know, some it's like a masculinity thing that you have this like powerful energy you need to do something with. And so, yeah, what is a modern day equivalent of that? Is it a dude that's a biker? Is it a dude that likes to go shooting? Is it a dude that like... I don't know, it was a part of a gang, you know, that it was interesting choice to make him a biker. Yeah, you can, and like the thing that's annoying is you can be competitive without being like a violent, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But in our society, it makes sense that Aries would be because that's kind of how we process like aggressive masculinity like that, because that's usually how it goes. Yeah. Um, it is like, I just think like it's it just makes sense when I think about like Ares and Clarice that she hates she hates Percy so much that she keeps attacking him in the second episode because because he killed the Minotaur and she's like threatened by that like she doesn't believe that he did it and thinks that he's lying because the idea that a 12 year old could do that just doesn't seem possible but it's because she sees it as like a threat to like herself somehow that if he did that that he was somehow like showing her up in some way when he has no idea who she is. And yeah, it's like he does, he's not a skilled fighter. We've talked about this. It's not like he won out of brute force. It's just he got a lucky shot in. And, you know, like that is his whole thing. I mean, it's kind of Harry Potter's thing too, where it's like you get lucky and you win by the skin of your teeth, but because it's a more interesting battle that way. Um, Clarice, she feels the need to be this best fighter, but that's not why Percy beat the Minotaur. Yeah, and Percy, more than anything, runs on, like, intuition. Like, he just kind of, he doesn't think too much about what he's doing in a fight, and that's, like, he has like, some basic training, but it's probably best that he doesn't have that much because he's better just, like, kind of reacting as it's happening instead of overthinking it. And I think that's why it makes people like Clarice so mad and Luke later on even, too, because they're like, how are you beating me when I know so much more than you? And, <laughs> and I'm not, like, yeah, like... You're, like, so wrapped up in what this fight means, and Percy's just like, I don't want to die, <laughs> so I'm just going to yeah. figure something out. And uh, Luke's you like, so much. It just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, Luke trained and trained and trained, and so it doesn't process on him of, like, oh, you know, I don't have to go for all this strategy I've trained, um, whereas Percy is like, yeah, I'm just going to block each shot. I'm just going to make sure I don't get hit as much as possible. I mean, the dramatized um, fights in fiction, I don't know. Like, you know, if he really got slashed a little bit with a sword, he probably wouldn't still be holding a sword. Um, but it's, it's interesting that um, it's just not a big part of who he is, the fighting, despite being a demigod. No, he has to do it, but... It's not exactly something he enjoys, which I think drives 
people like Clarice even crazier, like that he like that he accidentally breaks her thing, her her spear, her thing. I don't know what it's called, but the thing that she has that's the only thing she that Ares ever gave her is like this spear thing that like electrocutes people. And he just accidentally breaks it because she's trying to stab him with it and he just holds on to it. Like, if I hold on to it, she can't kill me with it. Exactly. And he accidentally, ki- like, and he's like, oh, what's this? And she, like, screams at him like she he just killed her mother. <laughs> and he's just like, I don't know what's going on. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> Can we stop fighting, please? I don't even know you. Like, who are you? Why do you hate me so much? I'm sorry yeah. that I made the bathroom attack you the other day. <laughs> like, like I don't even know how I did that. No, I, I have no idea. I'm just standing here. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's hilarious. I, and Walker Scobell, I know we keep praising that kid. He is amazing at doing it. Mm-hmm. He, yeah, I I love it. him in the capture the flag stuff. Is just like I don't know how you can watch those scenes and be like no that isn't Percy Jackson like the joke that people make about the trio is that Rick Riordan like shook the books and they just like popped out because they're so much like the characters yeah. but especially that part like him you know playing with like the lizard and stuff is just funny but also even with Clarice that when she first first walks up he doesn't realize what she's doing at first because she's like he's like yeah, why would this stranger want to like stab me? Yeah. And then he realizes, oh, she really wants to stab me. Yeah, and all she's gonna actually going to hurt me. Oh, shit. For a week, that's all that's going to happen to her. She stabs me. <laughs> like, where am I right now? <laughs> why are these like full grown teenagers that are like, you know, the, the actors at least are like 18 years old? Why are they attacking a 12 year old? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> Oh my gosh. They deviated too from the description of Clarice in the books, right? Yeah, one thing that people wonder about because Dior, who plays Clarice, is black, that she was supposed to use like ghosts of like Civil War soldiers (laughs) in the second book as the people who like are like running the ship that she has. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, uh, what the hell are they going to do with that? Like, we'll, we'll find out, like, eventually. But I might modernize like, that a little more. They like, could either get rid of that or they could make it even better that a Black person is, like, using those people for their whims. Um, but that's, like, one thing that is interesting about that. But they, I definitely think they they picked the right person for Cl- Clarice because she has to be really scary. And, yeah. like, and just, like, the ultimate bully like like every scene where she's in i like look away watching it because she reminds me so much of the people that bullied me in school Oh my god! (laughs) and i'm like that that means that they picked the right person because you need somebody who's like so intimidating like that that you could think that they could hurt him because otherwise everything else just doesn't make sense (laughs) Yeah, like, she makes it really believable, that scene on the beach where you're like, oh, shit, this girl looks scary. She has it out for him. One one funny behind-the-scenes thing is Walker Scobell said that when she screamed like that, when he when he accidentally breaks her spear thing, the how loud she screams, he is not acting by how scared he looks because he did not know that she was going to scream that loud. Oh, my God. And he's honestly yeah. like... She's gonna kill me. <laughs> and I'm like, that's hilarious. But that like scene also feels such like a Aries when you're not thinking thing too, that it, I think it's funny that that whole thing is Annabeth has him just sit there because she knows that Clarice and the most dangerous Aries kids on the other team are just gonna wanna beat up Percy and they're not even gonna pay attention to the game, so they're just gonna win. Yeah. And it's, like, absurd that she knows that that's going to happen, that they'd rather beat up a 12-year-old kid who doesn't know what's going on than, like, actually win the game. And they just, oh like, God. fall for it. Yeah, the fact that that strategy worked is just... And that really is the difference of Athena over um, Ares, is the idea of warfare strategy versus warfare, the act of actually going in and fighting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the funniest lines from 
the fifth episode when Aries, when Grover is emotionally manipulating Aries, is when Aries just starts ranting about how if everyone thinks Athena is smart, but she talks to an owl all the time as her best friend. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so glad that they're playing into the fact that they're siblings. <laughs> Because yeah. it felt like siblings yelling at each other, except that it's like the war god and like the and the other god that also is involved with war actually winning wars as opposed to just fighting. <laughs> but that was just too funny how they had him say that because I was like, yeah, why does she talk to an owl? Like, I love owls, but why does she talk to an owl all the time? <laughs> I can't remember. I think she might actually have like a little pet owl. I can't remember where that came from. But um, there's like a an old, old movie that has a depiction of the Perseus myth where it's like mechanical almost, um, where it's like a little robot owl. That just came to mind. I remember watching it in one of my classes. Just don't remember what movie it was. I'm trying to think of other things that happened in this episode. I'm mainly remembering the bullying. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess what we could talk about a bit is how they modernized it because, I mean, even going to that scene with Percy, like, distracting himself while he's waiting, he does, he, he's like, um, what's it called, fossing. And, like, yeah, that's, that's a modern thing. That wasn't a thing back when Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief, was written. But it fits, like, it fits that he would be the kind of kid sitting there watching Fortnite dances. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and would be, like, doing it while just sitting there while he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. Exactly. And especially the part where he, like, plays with the lizard. I'm like, yeah, that's Percy somehow. That's him just playing with a lizard in the middle of the woods. When And if some, I just imagine if somebody came up to him and was like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> like I'm just standing. I was told here. to stand here. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, like they told me to stand here. That that's the part I think is funny. Like Walker Scobell acting wise is how he's literally just like laying there on a log, and yeah. then Clarice walks up and he stand he stands up to like say hi, and then like slowly backs away. Like, oh, you want to murder me? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna change the locations now that my makeup's done. Okay hang out in my guest room. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so the choice of Clarice, I really liked her. I think she's so far has played it well, is going to be great to watch her in the next season, have to play it up a little bit more. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of her in Sea of Monsters. They keep having to, they run, they have to rescue her a couple times. They get stuck in some not so great situations because of her a couple times because she just like will not let them like she keeps wanting to be so aggressive that she causes more problems like she wants to just like blow everything up and fight everything instead of like like one of the big things from that i forget what they're called they're the sea monster things that are like in the ocean in the odyssey and yeah and like th when that whole thing like they could go around them mm -hmm. and like percy and annabeth are like why not just go around them and she's like no i want to fight them and it's like why they almost die during that yeah. part and it's just like one of those ridiculous things of like why are you doing this like you don't have to do why would you fight monsters on purpose like when you could go around them and you don't have to do it. It's just not at all how they would ever do anything. It just doesn't make sense to them. And I know yeah. that, that Rick Riordan had said that they would, they were going to make her more of a 3D character than in the books, which I'm really glad about that. And that's, I'm mostly excited about next season, her getting to yell about how much it sucks having a really aggressive, angry dad who doesn't yeah. care about you because um I would write like like a thesis statement about how great that scene is <laughs> if we get it and we probably will because Aries fucks her over so many times and just in that one season and there's other things that happen in the other books after that where he just doesn't care about her at all I mean it's kind of like Draco Malfoy in a way and uh, yeah so where people want to 
humanize this character because we recognize that it's not him, you know, that like all of the strings that are being pulled are from the Death Eaters, are from his dad. And so with Clarice, we see that. We see wanting to, her dad to be proud being a super, super huge thing. And Rick Riordan's a better author than J.K. Rowling. So, <laughs> yeah, him him being a part of exploring that for the series is going to be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he... The, it's I think it's kind of funny when you compare the two that, like, Draco doesn't get any real humanity until really like the sixth the book maybe even not until the um the prologue where yeah. he's like on the the trot or uh was it on the um the platform with his own kid you know that it takes like 47 yeah. years like it's you're not even completely sure until his mom lies to Voldemort and is like, yep, Harry's super dead, <laughs> that yep. they will like completely like do what they want. But, and like compare that to Percy Jackson, where in book two <laughs> out of five, they're like humanizing the Aries girl. And even when he's upset at Clarice in the first book, they're even pointing out to him, like she just thinks that you're lying. She thinks that you're lying about being better at fighting. And so she sees it as a threat and- yeah and things like that even though she's ridiculous still like they immediately are like no but don't just think that she's horrible and mean and i'm like oh like i remember reading the first book and being like this is what i wanted <laughs> like why isn't jk rowling like this yeah or like why don't more people know this series because this is way better what is i remember reading it back in 2010 being like what's happening like why do people like this other one especially because back then was when the harry potter movies were like about to end and so everyone was still talking about them and hadn't realized quite yet that J.K. Rowling yeah. is a monster. Oh my gosh, that's a good point about the timing. So yeah, because I, I had just, I think I read them my last year of high school or when I had just graduated. So that would have been 2008. And 2008, the beginning of my high school senior year is when the, like everybody had come back from the summer having read the seventh book of Harry Potter. So they were all just like, oh my gosh, this is what happened. Like, I, that's what prompted me to finally read the books is not all the movies were out and everybody was already talking about the ending. So I'm like, might as well. Yeah, they, the thing with, um, I remember I read, I'm so old that I read all the books when the first movie came out in 2001. And that was the first four uh, for Harry Potter. And then I had to wait, like everyone did, 57 years for Order of the Phoenix to come out. I think real time that was like two more years but that was a really long time in between books and um and so by the time the last book came out i was such like a already i already didn't like jk rowling <laughs> i didn't like her since um for a while since whenever or the phoenix came out and then especially when the sixth book came out and i didn't even finish reading it because it was so bad i was just like you are already seeing the red flags. Like, what are we, what are we, I like, I saw those when I was just in high school because honestly, this is maybe one of the only times being an abused child, like work towards my advantage that I was like, why does everybody keep making him go back to his abusive family? And like, I don't trust any of these adults because why would they make him do that? That makes no sense. Like imagine like a Percy Jackson story where Gabe doesn't get, killed by medusa's head and turned into a statue at the end of the first season but he keeps having to go back and live with him yeah like every year of high school until he's 16. that would have been atrocious and so that was like the weirdest dynamic that that was happening in that series but nobody talked about it so like you were supposed to be fine with it and yeah. especially when it ended up being like you have to go back to your abusive home for your protection it was like oh Oh my gosh well Gabe is presented as a level of protection as well like he his stench is supposed to keep away the monsters which is why Sally keeps him around and she still gets rid of him after Percy finds out and everything's you know like out in the open yeah she gets rid of him as soon as humanly possible like as soon as Percy knows she's like okay goodbye <laughs> like she's yeah. She's back from like the underworld within like two days and he's like kicked out of the apartment. <laughs> like exactly. there's, no, there's no time being wasted here. <laughs> yeah, it's 
it, you get that Rick Riordan not only understands these things better than J.K. Rowling, but that he might even have personal experience. I haven't looked into too much of him as a person, but yeah, I'm getting I that feeling. I don't, I don't know if there's even that much about Rick Riordan out there. Um, like, I've never wanted to look because it feels like weirdly invasive to look if an author doesn't talk about it himself. Like, I, most people know that like Percy and Annabeth is based off of him and his wife. And he wrote the books for his kids, which is adorable enough that I can just stop there. <laughs> but um, but he does have an Aries moon and you don't have one of those if you don't have problems being angry. <laughs> and like, it means that people didn't let you be angry if you want to go with astrology stuff. And so if he has one of those, then there's probably some stuff that he dealt with that wasn't that fun <laughs> in his life at some point. Well, I mean, and the millennial experience with this was the whole like fear around uh, people going to school and we'll, we'll put it, go, pulling a Columbine. Like that was the fear in the 90s and Aries kids frequently dealt with people accusing you guys of, oh, you give this vibe. And like, um, it never made sense to me how people will provoke instead of being like, oh, hey, I should support the person that's giving me this vibe. Yeah, it was, that was really weird. I was, I started high school in 1999. And by then there were like kids that were just as unpopular as me that would get called that because they just wore black. And I remember like yelling at the friends that I eventually made in high school when they did that stuff to be like, shut up. Like they haven't done anything. They're just wearing clothes and they come from a poor family so they don't have that many clothes to wear like leave them alone and yeah. it just is like weird that people would tease kids like that and they still do like i mean we can go back to even talking about percy like that like why would you tease a kid because he's not good at reading <laughs> yeah exactly not good at reading or and behavioral problems that's the one i was talking to my brother about this yesterday it was just like if you think that someone is on the angry spectrum and has behavioral problems like why would you piss them off For like purpose. yes on purpose <laughs> over and over again you know i will say one thing with the show that i really like they did with the bullying stuff in the second episode is when he walks into Hermes cabin and they're like going to introduce him and he like doesn't he like is like telling like panicking like telling them not to introduce him like when I was watching that scene I like looked away because I was like oh my god this brings back so many memories of especially the years when I had to switch schools a bunch of times of how horrible it is when a teacher wants to be like everyone say hi and you're like no they're gonna hate me <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> do, please don't do it. I was like, that's, I really glad that they did that because that's exactly what it's like when you're the kid that's bullied all the time when and going into a new place. You're just assuming that everyone is going to hate you. And yeah. I have like so many thoughts about the fact that the person that is nice to him is Luke because he wasn't really being nice to him. Like he praised, he like praised to Sally in that episode and says, I think I made a real friend and he means Luke. And I'm like, no, child, <laughs> this is going to yeah. suck. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you switch schools like that so often, you you kind of have oh, to be sorry, hyper. Sorry. I have someone in my that says they went to 18 different schools. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, went to, I changed schools um, from when I was like seven and I was in second grade to like beginning of fourth grade. I skipped, I changed schools three times. And that was bad enough. And like, even after that, I was still always, we, my mom refused to make us move after that. We just moved in the same little town, but we, she refused to make us change schools again. But just those three times were bad enough. We, we moved like 19 times, yeah. <laughs> but not outside of another school. That's so, that's so much. Oh my I God. Know, but like all those moves, you would have to become really adept to not only like nobody's going to like me when you go into a classroom, but these people are bullies. Like, you know, right away, they give me bullying vibes. So I'm going to just steer clear of these people my whole time here. That's pretty much how it is. You just kind of can tell the kids <laughs> that probably won't like you and you just learn to stay away or try to stay away from them. But that's hard to tell too, because you don't really 
Because when you move that often, you can't really make good friends because you always are leaving, even if you do have friends. Yeah. Like, one of the things that depresses me <laughs> in The Lightning Thief is that at the very end, Percy is talking about how Grover is his longest running friend and he's only known him for one year. Yeah, that is heartbreaking when you think about it that way. I remember I... me, though. That was me, too. <laughs> like, I didn't have <laughs> friends that have uh, lasted a long time either for most of life honestly that's just how it's kind of been there's been friends that have been around for a long time but they weren't like they were on and off and they weren't like good people necessarily they just were like the kids in middle school that would like let me sit next to them in class basically yeah. it was that sort of an experience not really friendship necessarily yeah and i i became jaded towards friendship i would say early college because that's when my found family had exploded. And um, so there, like, what makes me think of Grover is I had this one person who, like, they actually made an effort to be friends with me. Like, I was not hanging out with people after class. I was not trying to socialize outside of class. And I just would go to school, go to class, and then leave. So, you know, having a person who actively would see me like eating a salad and reading a book go, hey, you're in my class. Let's talk about this thing from class today was the only reason we became friends. And um, like Grover probably did that with Percy. That's what we have to imagine is that he approached Percy. He would talk to him. He would make conversation until finally Percy was like, OK, I guess we're friends. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, I feel like that would have been a lot of work. There's the person in my chat is talking about how they relate a lot to Percy's friendship situation, especially because before like the internet was how it was, it was so hard to find people online. And like, yeah, like these books originally came out in 2005. And back then it was like the live journal and like Yahoo groups <laughs> were the way that you talk to people. It was really hard to find anyone. And it was like impossible when you were like a shy neurodivergent kid it was so hard to find anyone that even liked the same things you did like when i was in high school i used to bring star wars books to class with me and people would know me as like the star wars girl mm -hmm. and they would make fun of me about that <laughs> yeah because that was also the years when the um prequel tr trilogy movies were like coming out during my high school years like the first one came out when i was a freshman and the second one came out when i was a senior i think and so it was like that's what people knew me as was like the gigantic nerd who liked all the things that you weren't supposed to like and i just didn't care because nobody liked me anyway <laughs> so i'm just going to enjoy the things that i enjoy and not like feel bad about them but it was like a very weird dynamic that I feel like Rick got really well so I'm like you must have had some stuff happen <laughs> to like get this especially not even from his own kids because his own kids like had problems at school getting along with kids which is why like I don't think I've ever met somebody who even if they were undiagnosed at the time with like autism or ADHD or PTSD or any of the things that go under the neurodivergency umbrella, which includes dyslexia too, that had an easy time at school. We, we have the hardest time ever getting yeah. through all that. It was, I feel like it was here on TikTok. I saw someone say, I might have not known I was autistic until I grew up, but the bullies at school sure did. Every single bully I had since like, man, I like, I was, <laughs> I was just talking about this in therapy last week, but people in like kindergarten and first grade didn't like me. And it was just like, and like there are other things going on with me that would explain that too, beyond just being autistic, but that definitely exacerbated the situation. And yeah. it, it honestly was like nice to read like a character like Percy who had the exact same thing going on and there wasn't like a quick fix to it. It's not like he can ever just get rid of the things that make school hard for him. It like just is normal for him. Even in the books after he knows who he is, he still gets kicked out of school almost every year. And like he only doesn't get kicked out of school because when his when his mom starts dating a teacher because his the teacher like Paul is wonderful and helps him like stay in a school longer than one year. And it's the first time that ever happened to him. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's just like okay like like at least there's some character out there that has gone through a little bit of some of the same stuff that i did which 
I I just I even though it's hard to watch those scenes of him bu- being like bullied at first at camp, it's also nice like <laughs> The second episode is so weird because I'm like, so this is the only time in Percy Jackson's life where he was for a very short time, just like everybody else until he gets claimed by Poseidon. And then he is immediately like stands out again (laughs) as being different from everyone else. I'm like, this is the only time in his life where he could have like fit in and then it's over. Yeah. (sighs) Over so quickly. And in the series, even quicker than in the books, because they have to get through the plot line a little bit faster. So we get one episode of him at camp, even though he's at camp for weeks, isn't he? Yeah, he's at least there for longer than it seems like in the show. I can't remember how many days, but he's at least there for a few days. You can, I don't remember, honestly. I feel like it happens like faster though, because he doesn't know what the heck he's doing. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Two weeks. Somebody in my in my comment my my thing is saying two weeks, which makes sense. And you can kind of see that in the show because they show those like that montage scene of him ruining things at camp when he's trying to figure out what he's good at <laughs> with yeah. is over probably a multiple day span. And he's like, Why is Annabeth stalking me? <laughs> yeah. That whole time <laughs> too. And so you can tell that some time has gone by, but yeah, that makes sense because it literally, it happens so fast for him that he doesn't even know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't even know how to use his own powers when he leaves to go on a quest. Like, let's yeah. just, sure, let's just go. <laughs> yeah, like he, he knows things about water, but he doesn't know specifically yet. Like he knows that he is accidentally, well, I don't even know if he suspects that he was the one who controlled the water when it grabbed um nancy bobo fit or when it like or when he was fighting clarice he probably doesn't at that point either he's probably just like i don't know what happened but the water just reached out yeah like he doesn't he honestly doesn't know what happened with nancy he doesn't know what happened um in the bathroom like i know that was like a scene we talked about last time where you said like that's where you knew that percy and annabeth were like the right actors because he's like i can explain and she's like no you can't (laughs) and are you stalking me and he's like she's like "Mm -hmm. yep i am (laughs) and it's like why are you stalking but he even in that scene he has no idea what is going on like annabeth knows because he know she knows about poseidon but like he has no clue like he knows about the greek gods but it's not like he's aware enough to think about his these weird things that are happening to him like that yeah and i think so the way they set it up the conversation with sally where she's you know telling him you are the son of a god i mean like she doesn't get to telling him which god so um you know the inner the way it gets interrupted with grover it could potentially be because of that but I have to wonder with the way that Rick writes these stories, if the people who get involved with gods know which one, you know, if they always know. I think Sally did know that it was Poseidon because of her being like, you need to learn how to swim in the fourth episode. Um, But uh, I, but there are some that probably don't know. Sally knew because she's like Poseidon's special little person, strangely. And, but I think Weirdly, I think it's honestly a good thing that he didn't know that because he doesn't know how anything works. So, like, I don't even want to think about what it would have been like if he showed up at camp and was like, I'm Poseidon's kid. (laughs) And he has no idea that Poseidon's kids are not supposed to exist, that he's immediately, like, in, like, suspicious of just for, like, literally just being alive as he is, he would have no idea about that. He would just be going around telling people, oh, yeah, I'm going to stay in this cabin because that's my dad, and everyone would just be looking at him like, what are you talking about? And he would immediately be, like, under suspicion for, like, I I just imagine, like, the entire, like, Aries cabin just meeting him there to, like, try to beat him up in person even more. And so I'm kind of glad that they didn't have time or or that she just didn't tell him because it was honestly a little bit better that he had to wait a little bit longer because that would have, he would just wouldn't have known and would have, worse stuff could have happened. (laughs) Yeah, well, I I mean, going back to Harry Potter, that's that's the situation Harry Potter gets thrown in is like, hey, you're kind of a big deal. Um, you're, You're really a big deal in this world that you're just now getting into. 
And we do see that, I mean, that makes more sense for Harry Potter's storyline because he's a Leo. <laughs> like, he is canonically a Leo. His birthday is like January 30th or something. And um, so, I mean, like, yeah, it makes more sense. But I, I don't see Percy going through a development like that the same way. I don't think so. It's weird that Percy, Percy's birthday is like three weeks after Harry Potter's fictional birthday. His is in August. Oh, so he would be a Leo too? It's August 18th. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's like just barely, almost a Virgo. I try to block out anything that I learned about Harry Potter, but that one is still in my brain. <laughs> like that his birthday is July 31st. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I love it because I love the fact that Harry is canonically a Leo. I feel like it explains a lot about who he, like how he's written, even though... J.K. Rowling is a terrible writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's whatever. It's like, you had to give him a birthday somewhere. I'm just glad that it's not mine. Yeah. At this point, I'm glad that he's not an Aquarius. Yeah. <laughs> Luna is probably an Aquarius, but I, I, I haven't looked be. up her, her birthday on any of the Pottermore stuff because I'm sure JK Rowling, because she's a weird after the fact control freak, she probably put like certain birthdays as canon. She knowing her though, like one of the funniest videos I saw in here after Percy Jackson aired that I know I sent to you was like if JK Rowling wrote um Percy Jackson and it was like a video of them saying just like the craziest things. Like Dionysus is actually like uh, I don't know, Dionysus gets married to, like, Grover after the show was over. I just never mentioned it <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. So, like, knowing her, she might just, like, I feel like three or four years from now, she'll just be, like, super spiteful about how everyone hates her. And, like, if her, like, redoing of Harry Potter she's trying to do to get more money to try to kill people with doesn't work, she'll just magically be like, actually, never mind, Harry's birthday is, like, November 27th because yeah. of reasons. I just decided to change it. He's now and a Scorpio. Then in the rewrite, she'll have Harry and Hermione actually end up together. Yeah, be like Ron was actually a, a big rat this entire time, and <laughs> or something like the opposite of Scabbers. He was actually a rat disguised as a person. <laughs> it was just really good at pretending, mm -hmm. and it, and they just realized it one day and decided that they can't do that anymore. What the. She said such crazy things that the thing that is the best about this is that none of these are, like, out of realm of possibility for her to say. It isn't, like, yeah. The thing, I was going to say this, but, like, it's, the thing about Rick Riordan, too, is that he's written books beyond, like, the initial, you know, ones that he put out. Like, he keeps adding on to the world. Like, there are books of, that are, he did take a really long break of writing because he wrote, Percy Jackson books for like 10 years straight or something crazy but he did take like 10 years off but he's writing them again and it's like imagine having a writer who like cares about his world and his story that he's willing to like add on to it and make it more complicated and complex like in some of the newest books like Percy is even questioning like did I do the right thing like not becoming a god and it's like yes you did the right thing not becoming a god he like realizes very quickly yes that was I don't want to be a god. He just thinks about it because he wishes that he could change things faster. And yeah. it, and that's literally all it is, is he wishes he could make them change things faster, which, of course, anyone who has intergenerational trauma wishes that. It's just not possible. But, like, the fact that they even bring that up again is like, oh, yeah. Like, remember what it's like when an actor, like a, when an author actually loves the world they created and wants to, like, improve on it instead of just... And even, like, the scenes that they add into the show that... Rick wants to add in scenes and is okay with them changing things because it's improving on a story he wrote like 20 years ago. Yeah. J.K. Rowling would like stab someone. <laughs> oh my gosh. She'd be like, yeah, stop inventing this stuff. Let me invent the stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. The person in my chat saying that Rick is someone who learned from his mistakes. I was going to make a video about this after this live, but he absolutely did. Like he wrote a couple books, like the ancient Egypt ones. Um, the Kane series? Yeah. yeah, I think I tried to read that one, and I was like, this feels like it's too derivative of yeah. Percy Jackson. He and But he, like, learned pretty quickly that, like, 
even just the idea like that he started his imprint of Rick Riordan Presents, where people who are from their own cultures can put out books about their own culture instead of he's like, I shouldn't be the one writing these things like you guys should. And like people critiqued him for that. And he was like, you know what? You're right. So I'm going to make this entire imprint and like promote these authors and give them a like a platform that otherwise they would never get. And like that's that's exactly what you should do when you get critique. Like you should listen to the things that people say that from those groups that hurt you so that you will actually like learn from them. Yeah. And honestly, one of my favorite things about the show is that out of all of the kids that are in the cast, the only person who's white is Percy. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes sense when you really think about it, like, cause Percy is the more, the most outspoken one that he can do that. And so it like just works that like the white kid is the one that yells at Zeus and like survives and like gives the other and like I just love the idea that Annabeth is played by somebody who's a black girl and by like the end of the series she is also yelling at gods and telling them to go fuck themselves basically especially Hera she really hates Hera <laughs> and she like literally yells at her multiple times just yells at her and doesn't even like try to stop and the fact that she feels like comfortable enough to do that because people know that Percy would literally like tear your head off of your body and kill you if you ever tried to even touch her even in the first five books people know not to do that and so I just like that, even though that's not what they meant to do, that it just makes the characters work better because they are people from that aren't just a whole bunch of white kids. Mm -hmm. It just makes like everything with Annabeth feels more like deep with her like being misunderstood and people not realizing how smart she is and not listening to her, even though she knows what's actually going on the whole time when it's a when it's a black girl playing her because people don't listen to black women. <laughs> And yeah. so it actually makes more sense instead of, I'm just blonde. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just blonde and people just don't listen, to, don't take me seriously because I'm pretty. Like, that is somewhat, I feel like, written to Athena in certain myths where it's, you know, this pretty girl in armor, are we really going to take her seriously as a warrior? But I like it so much better turned on this modern head of, like, oh, we're going to make her this serious, pensive um, black girl who people, like, don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny. The entire cast all have curly hair. I'm like, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but it makes me feel better because it means that somebody has to be there that actually knows how to work on black hair. Because so I know that's a problem in Hollywood. Just those little things are things that I like that they, like, took the time to think about. Like that they actually care about stuff like that. Hollywood is so horrible and I feel like a really jaded person, but that's like the bare minimum that like they have somebody who knows how to do one of the leads hair and knows how to do her makeup right. But like that was one of the things I saw people excited about when they first watched the show was that Annabeth looks beautiful mm -hmm. and like she should be beautiful, but like so many shows don't treat their black leads that way at all. And it's kind of funny that it's like a ch like, a thing that's meant to be like a children's thing is the one that's doing that. Yeah, well, I, Rick would be the one to, you know, because we didn't see him making a big deal out. I, I mean, I don't think at least that he had to make a big deal out of the casting in the same way that J.K. Rowling did when they did Cursed Child. I don't know if you remember that where she just like, her statement felt so like weird and phony and like, oh, I'm just going to endorse this because I'm getting money, not because I actually support this choice. Yeah, like Rick, Rick is the opposite of that, where, oh my God, the funniest, if you ever want to see Rick Riordan's Aries Moon, look up his old tweets from when he was the one tweeting. Now, the last however many years, he doesn't, like, he posts some things, but most of the things that are things that pe other people write for him on social media now. But for a while there, when all the books were coming out, it was just him talking. And when the Percy Jackson movies came out, which he had nothing to do with, he would post, don't see it. Like, literally, don't see the movie. Don't watch it. Don't tell me about it. I don't want to know anything about it. I wish that they would stop making them. Like, he is extremely blunt about how he... He's like, I have nothing against any of the actors, but I hate those movies. They're not at all what I wanted. 
and I wish that they would stop making them because people ask him how he feels about them, and he just keeps telling people he has never even watched them before, mm-hmm. and it hates everything about them. Like, I saw a video the other day that I, f- I did not see Sea of Monsters because the first movie was not good enough that I was like, I shouldn't see the next one. Yeah. And, but they said that in that movie, Kronos eats Luke. <laughs> That's a weird addition. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, I see where they were going with that, but geez. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, if you want to know what Rick Riordan thinks, he'll tell you. And then the other thing that I think is great is, you know, the, like, stereotypical thing that, like, racist people say online where they say they want the best person the best person for the role when they're trying to justify why everybody is, like, white in a movie or something like that. Like, Rick Riordan actually meant that, but, like, the way that it should be. Yeah. And so, like, he's like, yeah, like, all these characters are just going to be the actor that fits right. I don't care if it doesn't fit the description of any of them. Like, yeah, if yeah. you want to get really nitpicky about it, like, Walker doesn't even fit the description of Percy. Because yeah. Percy, all of the drawings of Percy, he has, like, black, like, really dark, like, my color of, like, brown hair. And it, and he definitely doesn't, he has, like, wavy hair, but he doesn't have really curly hair. And so, like, when you really think about it, none of them look like, like, how they're supp- supposed to. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because that doesn't matter. I feel like Walker, like... I like him so much better as a choice. So I thought I liked Logan Lerman, but like I, when I actually tried to watch the movie, I did not sit down and finish it. You know, I, I probably got to where he was at camp and was like, eh, this isn't for me. I watched watched the 2010 one back in 2010. And I remember at the time trying to gaslight myself that it was a good movie. Cause by that point I had read like the first, probably like two books or something. And then, but rec- there was a trend when the show started on here of people playing like the scene from the movie and then comparing it to the show. And I was like, oh my God, that was horrible. Like the, the video of that I saw recently was like when Percy wakes up in this episode, in the second episode, and he realizes that his mom is actually dead and Grover is there trying to like console him. The movie version, Logan Lerman sounds like he like lost his cell phone or something he's like oh no he, he, he's like oh my god that really happened i'm so upset it's like it 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 sounds like he's annoyed by something he doesn't sound like he literally is devastated because his mother just was murdered in front of him and the guy who plays grover is just like yeah sorry about that anyway we have other things to do and then they play the scene from the show where like Walker like cries during that scene like you see him like swipe like a tear out of off of his face and Grover's trying to talk to him and he's like go away like my mother is dead I don't want to talk to you but it's like insane that we tried to make ourselves believe that those movies were good because we had nothing else to go on (laughs) yeah I think we just liked that we knew Logan Lerman could play like witty sarcastic dude but Walker Scobell's witty and sarcastic Percy is so much better and it's so much more what the books had like because I feel like reading it now I am picturing Walker. I think um, somebody the person in my in my thing is talking about how people try to say that it's good every once in a while on like YouTube videos or something I'll see some comment that will be like I still think the movies are better and I'm like gaslighting is real (laughs) because there is nothing more that i can say that people who watched the percy jackson movies are still trying to convince themselves that they're they're not good they're horrible like why did they make annabeth dye her hair blonde like why did they make her do that like because that would magically make her more like annabeth does anybody watch this show and see leah and they're like she's not annabeth enough like no unless you're a racist asshole nobody is saying that because she is she is annabeth like everything about her is annabeth because the physical appearance doesn't matter when there's actual good writing (laughs) exactly like that they were they were trying to pick pretty girl lead to compete with your Emma Watson and what else was going on at the time? Um, I think we were, st- was that around the same time that um, the Hunger Games was starting? 
I feel like people wanted to compete with, yeah, like Emma Watson and, and, um, what's her face? <laughs> can't remember. And, and even, um, it's even weird that Logan Lerman is Percy. You are an adult. Yeah, Why? he was a full on adult. He was so much older. They're all adults. They're like supposed to be. Well, we, we did something, accept but... that a lot more in the early 2000s and in the um, in the 90s where it was like, oh, the, these are teenagers, but they're clearly like 30 year olds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like and I know that they want they a lot of times productions do that because kids have to have like legally have to have time for school when they're on set. And so it takes longer to film things. But like watching like this show, hours. it's like just just take longer like like per ah oh god we got that crazy thing that showed up last time but the percy show like took like 10 months to film and that is like a really long time because the entire main cast are all under the age of 18. this season two out of three of them are going to be under the age of 18 for like three more years and so they're it's going to take longer for them to film but it doesn't matter because they're so much better that like why why would i want to watch it just the story just doesn't make sense because the whole story the whole point of percy jackson is that greek gods are abusive parents because they're making these little kids go out there and be attacked because of them and they don't do anything to stop them yeah so and if, if kids... you're already an adult the first time you go through things it just that was one of the best things about this show was like watching these like watching 12 year old harry being played by walker who was only 13 years old and leah was only 13 when they were they filmed that entire season like little 13 year olds running around being attacked by huge monsters on the train and having to like run off having one of them have to like jump out of the arch in st louis and and like aries sends two of them to their death and doesn't tell them about that until they get there and so like all these things are happening to them it just makes the show's point before they even like say it out loud like they don't need to say it because it makes you upset watching them go through all this stuff when they're so young and yeah, like, when Logan Lerman is there like with like a deep ass voice being like hi I'm Percy Jackson <laughs> it just doesn't work the same way and gets a tattoo of his uh of his being claimed right away yeah where yeah, that yeah. would look now like they... what huh what what are you saying? Oh, the the tattoo thing. Do you remember that they added that in the movie? Like that yeah. looks look so strange on a twelve year old. No one would be like, "Oh, that makes sense. That's Poseidon's kid." We'd be like, "Why does that twelve year old have a tattoo?" He has a tattoo in the movie. I like honestly blocked out most of the movie. <laughs> in the movie, when he gets claimed, he gets like a little trident on on his arm, I think, or something like that. Guys, consent. <laughs> consent <laughs> is a thing. I was just I was just saying this to somebody else, but I like how we're comparing how Harry is like seen as like the chosen one or whatever and how Percy kind of ends up taking that on. And like Harry doesn't really have a choice. Like he is told by literally everyone, ev every everyone that ever talks to him that he is the chosen one. So he doesn't even have the choice to be like, what if I don't want to? Because everyone is just like, no, that's you. You're doing it. Goodbye. Yeah. But like with Harry or Harry with Percy there's at least like it's kind of an illusion of choice like he doesn't necessarily have a choice because of who he is as a person like when he takes on the when Thalia is like I'm not gonna do the prophecy anymore it's like well that's easy for her to say because she's giving it to a kid that would never give that away to somebody else yeah. because he doesn't he feels responsibility like that and wouldn't do that and so it's easy to give something like that up to someone that you know will not turn you down and will like accept it but he does technically have to accept it at least and it takes him a couple years to get there to even find out about it and say it like yeah i'm gonna do this but at least he has like more of a an option he at least has the option to say no even if he never would where like Harry doesn't even get the op like from because of something he did when he was a one year old baby. Everyone's like, yeah, you're just star messiah now. Yeah, he didn't even well, and he didn't even do anything. That's the thing, too, is he just existed and didn't die. <laughs> like, I just don't even know what to say about that. Like, all I remember about the movie is that for some 
unknown reason, the big battle with Luke was in the middle of New York City on the top of a like a skyscraper. And there was like water coming out of like the pipes. <laughs> Over dramatized. I don't know why they're in New York City. Why, like, the scene in the book is him in the middle of the forest at camp and he tries to kill him with scorpions. I personally think that change in the show was what it should have been all along. Like, that was so smart to have Percy and Annabeth figure it out beforehand and just lie to Luke. Like, the scene before they go and meet up with Luke is so funny because. Percy looks like he wants to punch Luke every time he comes near Annabeth. And so it's like the first time you watch it, you're like, why is he so mad? And then you're like, oh, that's why, because he already knows. But yeah. that I think was really smart of a change. But like, why would you change it to, they're not even at camp. They're so, for some reason in like the middle of Manhattan and they're, and he's using water to like, he doesn't know how to do that yet. Like he's 12, like granted you're 16 now, but he, doesn't know how to use water like that and actually use it in a fight yet he's not good enough at this yet and you're whatever <laughs> that's all i remember from that movie it just being like this is so weird this is not percy but i'm trying to make myself believe that it is because this is the only thing that we have um yeah, and now. <laughs> yeah well i mean the the only good book to movie adaptation we had at that time was lord of the rings right and even then we knew that they took stuff out or shortened it or changed up where it appeared but it was still the only one that we had that was good and that one took so many hours so back in those days all of us just accepted we are never going to get a good book to movie adaptation because no one was willing to do a series yeah like um, that one i will say was I remember it's kind of it's funny for me to remember this the only reason i ever read the percy jackson books was because the movie was being made because i remember being on twitter way back then in 2010 which was like two years after it even started like hardly anybody was on it but for some reason i was on it and i saw people talking about it and being like who are fans of it already and were like rick has nothing to do with this movie so this is probably going to be like god awful bad and they were mad about some things in the trailer and that is what made me like read the books like i got to work early one day so i went to barnes and noble to like kill time and i saw the book because it was on like the shelf about like books being made into movies soon and i read started reading them and i was like wow these are really good. And so it's weird that I started reading them because those horrible movies were being made. But especially back then, you're, you're right where The Hunger Games came out that year, but it wasn't out yet. And I don't even like The Hunger Games movies. Like, I think that it's a farce in itself for there to be a Hunger Games movie trilogy being made by Hollywood when the hunger games is the hunger games it's literally about those people and so it feels like a joke already for hollywood to be making the hunger games and be like coming out with like merchandise of like makeup and stuff from the hunger games and so that was already weird enough on its own but like it was very much kind of like it was a weird time because harry potter movies were dominating everything then that um, I remember seeing it and being like, is this just, there were so many books that were coming out then that were just like Harry Potter and Hunger Games, like knockoffs. Yeah, Twilight was also big around then. Yeah. And so I was like, is this just like a Harry Potter, like, like knockoff series? Like somebody, they just had somebody write a series that isn't that good. Like a lot of those books were at that time. But then when I read it, I was like, never mind. This is actually yeah. better than Harry Potter. But that was like sacrilege to say even then. Like people would look at me like I was crazy <laughs> for saying that I didn't like J.K. Rowling then and thought that the books weren't as good as they thought and that a lot of the movies I didn't like and okay. things like that. Like it was so dominant that it was hard for people to even pay attention to anything else. Yeah. And I can only hope that maybe it's like a good thing that it took this long for Percy Jackson to be adapted because it's honestly, like it's honestly the best adaptation I've seen since the original Lord of the Rings books it, with the way that it gets all the characters right and like the tone of the world right and the things that are actually important. And it's the first season when that's hard to do because you're setting up 
the world. You yeah. have to explain things that you don't have to explain anymore in the seasons going forward. And it's just exciting to see how well it was made and how much people who are making it all cared about it that um that it just makes it even more exciting to imagine how long this could go on for as long as disney lets them do whatever they want and they should because it was insanely successful yeah yeah and i i w i'm looking forward to how they adopt it because i think there's been hasn't it been a couple years between filming where they're like now filming the film of, or the sea of monsters or something yeah, yeah. the writer strike definitely messed them mm -hmm. up a little bit like i need people to stop saying that walker scobell is too old because that child like literally has anxiety about aging <laughs> like oh, he no. mentions in interviews that he's scared that too much time has come by and i'm like you are 15 years old <laughs> and yeah. you're and you're going to be playing someone that's 13 that is really just fine like it's really fine especially the writer's strike the fact that they couldn't do anything at all for like the entirety of last year basically it mm -hmm. i think that the sh because they finished filming in february of last year and then the writer strike happened in like june or something like that and it went for most of the rest of the year and so if that writer strike hadn't happened the show probably would have come out sooner on disney plus to begin with and they would have probably already been filming sea of monsters i'm assuming that they're probably gonna actually film it like this summer because they rick riordan has said that they were already writing like working on it um like writing the episodes when they weren't really supposed to <laughs> during the strike, they were doing it anyway. Um, and so they have a lot already worked on and, and they have a lot of things they already have planned. And so it won't take as long when it comes to at least like, it took, I don't even want to think of, it took like a year for them to actually cast like Walker as Percy. Yeah. Um, and they don't have to do any of that anymore. They have a couple characters to add in, but not in the same way as they did before. Yeah, because now they, they have to make sure that they interact well with the cast that's already there, that's already spot on. In my comments is saying that there is a casting call for Tyson, which makes sense. There, He's like the character that will be he's in the, the... Cyclops, right? The Cyclops brother? Yeah. That is... That should... I'm kind of excited about that because of the like disability allegory. Like, I, d I don't know if you remember this, but in like the very early like printing of the of the Sea of Monsters, they have kids at school are bullying um, Tyson and mm -hmm. Percy befriends him. He's like a homeless kid that he just befriends because he's Percy and that's what he does. And the kids at school that are bullying Tyson call him like the Arsler. And yeah. Percy is like, he is not that, and says like the word, they took it out of the other prince, which I could get where people not, wouldn't want to see it at all, but I'm like, he's saying it because you're not supposed to, that's like honestly a really good thing that Rick Riordan put out there at that time, because people still use that word a lot then. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I still have my original copy, so. Yeah, and it, and it was, um, <sighs> I saw something that it was taken out at some point, like at least the print version. But I'm glad that he put that in there just to because it's a very obvious way to say, like, you should not be saying this word ever. But Tyson is kind of like this weird, not weird, but like this sort of allegory for disability or like more like dis like disabled kids that aren't able to like get by like Percy and Annabeth and stuff are with their disabilities. And it's Tyson is so sweet <laughs> to Percy. He loves Percy. And like, I'm not looking forward to the part of the season where Percy is going to think that Tyson is dead um, because that sucks. That sucked in the book. He wants to, he in the book. He says that he wants to jump in the ocean and drown himself when that happens. And so that's not fun, but he does come back to life and he's Tyson is the sweetest character. <laughs> and so it's that I'm looking forward to because Annabeth is afraid of Cyclops and like hates them because she was tricked by one when she was like out on the run with like Luke and Thalia and stuff. So that should be interesting to see how they handle that whole dynamic. But yeah. I think him and I know there's another, there's like the guy who takes over Chiron's spot at camp, who's another new character, but he's not, it's not like a, he won't be, he would hardly be in it anyway. But Tyson is like the big one that will 
be like a because he's on the quest with them and stuff yeah yeah that'll be interesting i remember really enjoying tyson when i read the books i don't remember the books as much though but i just remember he was the character that i gravitated towards of like oh my gosh this one's my favorite and i remember sea of monsters being my favorite of the books too is it because you love the odyssey yeah yeah it's a little bit because of that i love the um, odyssey stuff and i used to read the second book a lot when i like didn't want to read anything that was like serious because it's before everything gets really serious but it's still and it's still fun though because i also i like vaguely remember the odyssey which means that i really liked it <laughs> when i was yeah. young because i don't have that many memories from those years especially stuff at school and so if i remember it at all it means that i really enjoyed it but i do remember really liking for some reason they showed us like a movie when we were in school of the odyssey I and think there is really a movie like depiction, but it wasn't popular because back like so when I was in school, that's when I, I don't know what year Brother Where Art Thou came out, but that's supposed to be an adaptation. And so people in classics classes started showing that for the Odyssey instead afterwards. That was like a weird trend, like remaking, like not this is so not the same thing, but like how 10 Things I Hate About You is off of um which they yeah and it was like a weird trend like they did like that with like she's the man is mm -hmm. like another one of those it was like, like no about nothing i think yeah like can percy jackson like do like this weird trend again where they like remake like old plays and old classics into like it's now weird. because i love them like the big like thing of why i wanted to read percy jackson was because i'm like i like greek gods this should yeah. be <laughs> Well, the, the big reason why I wanted to study them is because, like, the ultimate, it's like the ultimate inspiration for writing. I was much more of a writer back when I was a student. And, like, you know, even if you go to Shakespeare, Shakespeare drew inspiration from, like, ancient mythology. Someone in my, um, in my chat's asking if you've ever seen Epic. I haven't seen Epic. I haven't I seen Epic know. either. Mm -mm. Have you ever... I see I see videos sometimes of people talking about how bad Lore Olympus is. I think that's a book. I haven't I heard that. Yeah, I'm not as up to date on the modern ad adaptations. Like I haven't read Circe or Song of Achilles. I own it, but I haven't actually read through it yet. Um, so I do know that there are like there are people who play Cersei. with it. That's somebody that will be in next season is Cersei. Yeah. That's interesting and to think about who they would cast for that. Because she's already a rich character in the Odyssey without like having a lot of detail about her. We know that she turns men into animals. And as a modern audience, we, we like 100% understand her. She's like, men are pigs and dogs, so let's make you pigs and dogs. <laughs> yeah. Like, even in Sea of Monsters, Percy is, like, really upset about the fact that he's, oh, like, a hamster. And he's like, I don't want to be a hamster anymore. But he's also like, okay, but she hates women. So it's like a trend. Like, the second and third book are just characters that hate men. And Percy's just standing there like, hi, my mom is great, so I also love women. And actually do love women. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to put up with this, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, and we've been talking Percy Jackson versus Harry Potter, but, like, you can tell which one has a genuine, like, love and respect for the material versus, you know, just is like, hey, this is a thing that's existed for a long time, so let me capitalize on the idea that, like, you know, this kind of stuff makes money, that it's powerful. Um, I feel like, because even... Even the bit in the very, very first chapter about Mr. Brenner being a Latin teacher and being the teacher who brings armor to class and has like these races on the board where you have to write down every name of every person you remember. That is Latin teacher vibes. That is what being in a Latin class is like because you have to get kids interested in these ancient languages somehow, you know, you have to bring the fun into it somehow because they don't see it right away. You don't get into the fun until you actually learn how to translate. And um, so it, you, you get it in talking about these stories, you get it in reenacting some of these things. And Rick bringing that in 
that's how you could tell not only does he love the mythology, but he loved learning it. He loved being in the classroom with it. And he appreciates the type of people who do love this. That's why I think I love like the Greek, not just the Greek, but like the mythology stories, because the gods are like a mess. They're they're always doing things wrong. They are making a disaster out of like everyone's life. And I love that the books are exactly like that. They go even harder on them than I think most things do. Like they literally are like, these people are abusive. <laughs> they're like, like in the second episode, Percy is like, why would they start a camp and then not claim us when we're here? And, and they're just basically like, don't even question it because the things they do don't make any sense at all. So don't even try to figure it out. But it's like, they are so flawed and it's way more fun to see like God figures that are so flawed instead of the Christian version that is just like, you have to follow me because I say so, otherwise I'm gonna kill you. And it's like, you actually are an abuser. <laughs> Like well, at least the other ones, you they are still like yeah. don't 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 say that they're not, but at least they like are are like the abuser where they're self aware that they're abusive. Like they're like yeah we suck, like we genuinely like, there's there's entire conversations during this show where Hermes is like yeah we suck at this and we don't know what the hell we're doing. At least they can admit that the like Christian version of God would like throw a temper tantrum and flood the entire world if you even tried to bring that up to him. <laughs> Well, yeah, like you get the sense that the collection of immortals are are like, I, I guess the comparison could be the Volturi in Twilight, where it's like just these people who have enough power who are immortal. Like that's that's what they are. That's what the gods are. They're not the pillars of morality. They're not the pillars of culture. And one of my chat brought up that the difference between Harry and Percy is how much Percy hates authority. That is Aries Moon. We yeah. hate authority. If somebody tells me what to do, even if it's something that I should do, I won't do it because they told me to. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, my therapist for years has been like, you should go on a walk every day. And I'm like, no, because you told me to do it. And I know that it would work. So I'm not going to do it because you told me to. Thanks for ruining that for me. <laughs> and also, like, going back to the whole, like, Percy is technically, like, he has ADHD. He's disabled. So, like, think about how it is an ADHD kid experience, especially in the early 2000s, of having these authority figures that don't understand. You physically cannot stay still, so that is why you were wiggling, or that's why you're looking around instead of looking at them. So many people would, I, I'm, I don't have ADHD, I don't think, but I am autistic and we stim a lot as anyone can, who watches me can see. And I can't even tell you how many people would be like, stop moving, especially like my sister. Oh my God. Since she was like four, she has told me to stop moving my feet because I move my toes like all the time back and forth as like a, like a, just a constant stim. Like I'm always doing that. And she would always get mad at me. <laughs> she still does. And tell me to stop. And it's like, I can't stop. Or if I do stop, then I'm going to get really anxious. And they like don't, especially in like the 90s and early 2000s, they did not understand the connection that if you tell a kid in class that's like fidgeting a lot to stop fidgeting, and then they like have an outburst where they just say something they're not supposed to, those two things are connected. That's why mm -hmm. we're doing those things because we have to get that energy out of our body somehow or we just start panicking <laughs> that's like the other option like i since i was abused as a kid i d couldn't do things like that so instead i would just start like panicking inside my own head when people would tell me to stop i would just stop and then be like freaking out the whole time and would just act like i was fine that's not a good option either <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know why I've been able to train myself to have more, like, acceptable stims. Like, I don't know if you realize how much I will, like, nod my head while people are, um, are saying stuff. Part of that is because I realized that was an acceptable stim in class. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I get that, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it, it's now like a, a thing in conversation of like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Like, I am paying attention to you.
The grandma that I'm pretty sure was also autistic, the one that used to info dump to me about birds, and I would just sit there and listen to her about it. She would talk with her hands a lot, which is what I do, but she used to talk with her hands so much that when my mom would want her to stop talking, she would just grab her hands, and then she wouldn't be able to talk anymore, and she would just oh stop God. talking. And then my mom could finally say what she was trying to say, and then she would, like, let let them go. <laughs> like, why are you to picture like that works though because if somebody grabbed my hands when I was trying to concentrate to remember what I was trying to say by moving them I wouldn't be able to speak anymore either my my brain just like goes blank <laughs> if I if I can't do that it just doesn't work <laughs> oh my god I think it's funny to notice stims now that people do it's very it's usually very like low-key but once you see them you like can't stop seeing them Mm -hmm. Well, I, we, we talked about this a little bit too, and maybe this is where we can leave it off, is the um, the urge that the abused kid has to save other people before themselves, because that's where this episode does leave off, is that um, he finds out that his mom is still alive in the underworld, which prompts him to actually accept the quest. Mm -hmm. That's... Um, if you could really like boil down, like I saw somebody make a post about this once that Percy Jackson as like a fandom is kind of unique because usually the main character and like a big thing like this is not people's main character, but we are fucking obsessed with Percy Jackson. This fandom loves Percy Jackson more than anyone else. Like mm -hmm. the other day I saw like somebody liked to comment on a video that I commented on in early 2021. And my comment was just, I love Percy. <laughs> and it was just a video yeah. about him. And I honestly think that is why people love him so much is that he goes on these quests, not because he's supposed to, because he doesn't care what he's supposed to do. He goes because there's something that he actually cares about. Like in, the first book, it's his mom. The second book, it's helping Grover. Like, he doesn't actually care enough. He cares a little bit about, like, the camp, but it's, you know, it's not like he's heartless, but he cares most about helping Grover. In the third book, he literally fights people nonstop because Annabeth is gone. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that book is ridiculous because of Annabeth being gone. The fourth book is about, like, well, the fourth book is them being attacked at camp, but he goes on Annabeth's quest. The fourth book, the Labyrinth quest, is Annabeth's quest, and she brings him along even though she's not supposed to. <laughs> she literally <laughs> breaks the rules and is like, I'm just bringing Percy anyway. Bye! <laughs> and, yep. and then, of course, the last book is, like, the big one, but where he is literally the one having to finally do all these things and a giant war, like, starts in the middle of Manhattan. <laughs> but, like none of the things he does are necessarily because he's supposed to he doesn't do them for like altruistic reasons like he you have to convince like i love the fact that in this episode um like dionysus and them are like flabbergasted at the fact that he doesn't want to go in the quest and yeah. they have to try to make him they have to blackmail him into going by mm -hmm. and grover knows that about him already and shows up and is like your mom is still alive and then he immediately is fine with it but otherwise he was not going to go. No matter what they said, he was not going to go. And that's what makes him so great because most people aren't going to do like the altruistic like thing that you're supposed to do for a bunch of people that you don't even know. It's like, I don't, I don't know these people. I don't mm -hmm. know this world. Nobody. And I've been in this world for 10 minutes and this girl keeps trying to kill me in the bathroom. <laughs> and so like, why am I going to go do this crazy quest when I'm a 12 year old and I have no idea what's going on for a bunch of people that I don't even know because some gods that I don't even know think that I did something because of my dad who I've never met before. Yeah. But if you talk to me about my dad or my best friends or like my mom, then I'm going to go because that actually, because that actually makes him a real person. Mm -hmm. And I think like really him and like, not just Harry Potter, but a lot of kind of heroes like that. That's the thing that makes them feel less human is I think it's kind of ironic that a lot of those heroes, the things that people don't like about them is like they're more human traits. Like people don't like that Luke Skywalker in Star Wars is impulsive in the same way that he will make impulsive decisions to save people that he loves mm -hmm. and it, that aren't rational. And those are the things that fans get mad at him about. I'm like, no, that's what makes him a great character. Yeah, like, I want to see somebody just make the right decisions constantly and never do anything wrong. That's not a real person. Yeah. Well, so I think 
this is also why I'm so happy that they wrote in this version of Sally to the show where she purposely does not want him to be like all the things that the stories of the gods depict. And when you go to the idea of Kleos, which they bring up in the show, they even say it in Greek, it's the idea that people will know you by name, by your deeds, which uh, doing a quest, hello, you're going to get known by, I am the person who completed this quest. Um, it goes along with the the um, the wanting Kleos, wanting your name to live forever. And because Percy was not raised with the expectation that he's going to follow this culture, and because his mom even actively spoke against that in a way, in, at least in this version, we get the sense that she did. He hears this quest and he's not immediately thinking, this is going to be my Kleos. Yeah. And well, and also as an abused kid, you don't want attention. Like, why would I want people to know me? Like any time, the only people that have known me so far don't like me. So why would I ever want to do something that would bring more attention to myself? Like yeah. that's very much where he's coming from. Like, why would I want to do something like that? I don't want to. So why would I ever think about, it's just, we see things so backwards from how, like most little kids would be excited about something like that. But when you get negative attention your whole life, you're like, that's what you think attention means. And you would never want to bring that on on you for any reason. Well, Chiron, I mean, not Chiron, Chiron had one of his own charges, Achilles, do literally the exact opposite. Achilles knew that he would either have a short but very honor-filled life where people would know his name and his his deeds after he was dead or he could live to be an old man and be boring as fuck you know and like nobody would know him his name would not live on forever he chose short life purposely like chose that path that is where chiron's coming from is i come from a long lineage of heroes who want this and percy doesn't want this yeah and oh person in my comments who says that it's interesting to think about how much Percy's choices in the series are shaped by his abuse. This is all that I talk about. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's Shannon's of, on this. This is part of why we started this whole live thing. So hopefully you come back because that is why I love Percy Jackson is that as a, as like a world because it's it's something that I identify with. Like the idea of having like a debt on you because you were born is very much what I experienced and you experienced growing yeah. up. And it's really nice to have a series that shows that in the light that it should be, like doesn't try to make it better. And, or like yeah. the way that people try to lessen that stuff in other series, they're, they're like, no, this is terrible. And you should be upset about that. And Percy reacts to things the way that you would if you actually were abused as a kid, which is one of the million things that I hate about Harry Potter is that she makes him abused to give him a sad backstory, basically, but doesn't actually write him like an abused kid would most of the time. Yeah. And that's just horrible. Like, he was one of the only abused kids that I knew when I was being abused at home um, that I could read in something, and he was told that he was too angry all the time and he shouldn't be so upset. And it was like, do you know how messed up that is when you're an abused kid that people are constantly telling you that you're too upset about the things that are abusing you? Yeah. <laughs> like, that just gets in your head because you're already, they're already telling you that sort of stuff already and that just makes it worse. And the idea that Percy Jackson is out there and has been out there for so long and is telling kids, no, you should be upset by that. Like your parents should be treating you better than that. That makes such a huge difference in, in a way that like, is like amazing to think about which is why people love rick riordan so much yeah it's like jk rowling was just so nonchalant about the abuse and neglect that harry went through i'm thinking back to i can't remember i think it might have been the beginning of the second book where he had saved a birthday cake for weeks and was eating it from under his floorboards because he wasn't getting fed enough because dudley was on a diet yeah, like yeah. And the second book is when they like put like the bar, like the like the prison bars, like on his on window, window. Wait, so he can't, so he can't get out. The second one, it can't be the second one. Yeah, it's it's probably later in the series, but they're 
there was one where he was saving cake for weeks under his floorboards at the Dursleys. They didn't, they don't feed him. And like the thing that is the worst about the whole prison bars being on his windows is that when he gets broken out by Ron and Fred and George in their car and he gets to Fred and George and he gets to the Weasley house, Molly Weasley, when she hears that story is like, you should just be glad that I don't put those on your windows. And I was like, sorry, is this, is this the family that I'm supposed to idolize that I should want to be a part of? Yeah. Like 17 year old me was like, I hate you. Like I hated Molly Weasley from that point on and didn't, I didn't really like her anyway because the first book she screams at Ron for like five minutes and embarrasses him in front of everybody. But I especially didn't like that either. And you can't help but notice those things. And at least when you're aware of it, when you've gone through those things yourself and be like, why is this author trying to convince me that this is okay? that like that I should want to be a part of this family that just like heard that a kid is being like literally trapped inside their own house and can't leave and your response is you should be glad that I don't make you a prisoner yeah like what is I, I there aren't even worse for that yeah the only explanation for how the Weasley parents treat Harry that I could ever ever think of is just they've known that this is for his protection all along and have become jaded to that fact and are like just well this is it so I'm gonna make jokes about it um but even <laughs> JK Rowling doesn't go that far there's this guy um I don't know his name but he's he has like a he does like a class at his like he's a professor at a college oh, and his video yeah and he so <laughs> the other day his video came up and the beginning first like sentence he asked in the video is is molly weasley a good mom and i stopped the video like um comment no and moved on <laughs> and he like liked the comment but i was like i don't need to watch more of your video because i already know she's not <laughs> like next question <laughs> Yeah, like, as as a younger kid that had no experiences with manipulation and abuse, you'd think, like, oh, it's kind of cute that she turns on Hermione when there's this rumor that Hermione is Harry's love interest and well, that she she's treats, betraying him. She's horrible to Fleur. She's, yeah. She's your mom. Like, she's your mom in those moments. Like, like, being like, you're taking away my precious son and things like that. It's like, she would be on TikTok being like hashtag boy mom. Yep. <laughs> oh my god, I can't even handle that. Like poor Ginny. No wonder why she's so she doesn't even have a personality. <laughs> well, she does have more of a personality in the books, but the personality is just like, oh yeah, I'm a girl who who tussles with boys because I have brothers. <laughs> she's literally a pick me. She's like, I'm not like those other girls. Like, I honestly could never, I, I just try to, like, pretend, like, Harry didn't end up with Ginny because it makes no sense. And it especially doesn't because she literally does things in the book that doesn't make sense for him. Like, she says, like, I idolize you as, like, the the chosen one. Like, that's what I idolize about you. That's why I like you. She literally tells him that when they break up. So I'm honestly fucking mystified why they got back together and had many horribly named children. Because... <laughs> Why would he want to be with someone who doesn't even see him as a person? Like, yeah. to like talk about Percy Jackson again to compare the whole story with like Nico and Percy is that Nico idolizes Percy and puts him up on this pedestal because he's this older kid who teaches him how to do things in like the, you know, in the world. And he gets so angry at Percy when his sister dies, even though it's not Percy's fault and even though he blames himself for it because that's what he does. He gets so angry at him because he's being forced to realize that Percy is a real person. That he's not like this superhero perfect person that he thought he was when he was a 10 year old little kid. And like that entire story of him and Nico is Nico realizing that he's put all these projections onto Percy as a person and he doesn't even know who he is most of the time and that he needs to stop doing that because he's like putting this child through hell, like blaming him for his 12 year old sister being killed when it was not his fault at all and he couldn't have stopped it and he did try to stop it. It just couldn't, it just didn't work. And, but he's puts him through all this stuff because he's mad that he's not this like imagined version of Percy Jackson that doesn't exist. Like they do an entire story to tell you that it's not right to do that, that you shouldn't do that to people because you don't actually know who they are. 
in Harry Potter, Ginny gets married to Harry. <laughs> yeah, well, what works about about Percy eventually ending up with Annabeth is that Annabeth very much acknowledges the human part of Percy. She's She calls him seaweed brain, you know, she acknowledges that sometimes he's impulsive and stupid and she both loves that about him and wants to like channel it for good. And he loves that she's always, you know, so intellectualizing things that she doesn't stop to like, feel i i guess like because that's what we see in this this first season of percy jackson and the olympians is he really challenges her to stop and feel once in a while yeah I, that's why i love percy there's a million reasons to love percy and annabeth but that's one of the best ones is that's why they work so well is the things that they don't like about themselves are the things that they love about each other like that's just how it works like annabeth doesn't like being vulnerable it's scary to her it's scary for her to ask for help she's been burned a lot by really traumatic things that happened to her too but like percy is constantly challenging her and asking her to trust him asking her to she has to like be vulnerable with him because he doesn't do things for the same reason that everybody else does he's not just going to do it because they're supposed to he you have to actually tell him why he's supposed yeah. to do it and like the the third book is one of my favorite ones and one of the reasons why is because that whole book when she gets kidnapped like people have to hold him down to stop him from jumping off of a cliff to go after her and then the entire book he's just like i just have to get back annabeth and i don't care i literally do not give a fuck about anything else and she knows that entire book that he is going to come after her no matter else what happens like it's really nice that at the end of that book that somebody like annabeth can ask him like did you ever believe that i was dead and he's like no of course not yeah, and like yeah. literally everyone else thought that he was dead and was trying to convince harry to and every time they did he would be like i will fucking kill you <laughs> and but that's like the literally every time somebody brings something like that up to him he just starts screaming at them which like thank you <laughs> for doing that but like that's such an amazing thing to be somebody like annabeth that has to act like she is like she almost can't show her emotions because people don't almost don't expect her to have them that she is he is somebody that wants her to show those things and is somebody that's actually dependable on her because she shows those things like if she never like if she left him in like the chair like in the fifth episode he would have died mm -hmm. and that would have been like the end of percy because she like was like no this person is my friend and i need to get him the fuck out of this chair and i'm gonna scream at this god until they let me do it that's why he lives and that's like the best kind of message you can give a bunch of traumatized kids <laughs> that sh like sharing your emotions with somebody is a good thing yeah and they happen to share it with the abused god and like that is what makes it work. And I I know we've talked about this already before too, but I love Hephaestus. I love that they give him that backstory. I love that they did that with Hephaestus too. Cause I, I've always liked Hephaestus when I read Percy Jackson the first time. I really liked him, like the whole crazy stuff that happens with the volcano in the fourth book isn't exactly his fault. <laughs> and he's honestly the one God that is pretty nice to his kids and um percy and annabeth and stuff in general most of the other gods won't help them or will make them do ridiculous things like hephaestus would never trap like i i think sometimes about how Ares sent them there knowing that one of them was going to have to sacrifice themselves in order to get his stupid thing back and he sent them there anyway knowing that and just didn't care like hephaestus yeah. would never do something like that to those kids yeah, he would. And um, I mean, Hephaestus, it doesn't matter which version of the mythology you go with, whether he was Hera's child alone or Hera's and Zeus. Either way, he was rejected by a parent immediately. Like, he, and so, yeah, him not rejecting his kids in that way, him being supportive of heroes, him like helping them out. I just, I, I love the choice. I also love the choice of actor. It's going to be interesting as we see him more too. I really hope we see more of him. And he's even in the second series of books, the ones you haven't read yet, Heroes of Olympus. Most people's, including mine, favorite character that's one of the new people is Leo. And Leo is an Hephaestus kid. And 
there's a whole story of them of him having to build something for them to use in those books and um so Hephaestus is around in those books and he's really nice when in those books too he's helpful and actually helps them build stuff instead of just being like I don't care go die somewhere <laughs> well and I mean Hephaestus does help heroes that is can it's canon in a way because I believe at least the hero or the shield of Achilles was forged by Hephaestus I want to say that he probably forged a couple other heroes shields but um we know that he can lovingly create something for a hero when he's called to do it so Yeah, and the shield of Achilles, it's it's like such a big deal. I want to say there's a whole chat or a whole book of the Iliad describing like the shield has this on it and this on it and this on it. Um like it's a piece of art. It's not just a shield. I think it was really big. Mhm. Mm yeah. All right, I got to end here and um get to my the rest of my Sunday, but we can talk a little bit about episode three. I'm trying to remember what happened in episode three. I might have to rewatch this time. Medusa. Medusa. Oh yeah. The Furies too, in the very beginning, the other Fury shows up and they have to get away from her. Oh yeah. And, but, but Medusa and Uncle Ferdinand and Percy and Annabeth just fighting and Grover trying to stop them by singing a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good addition too. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about that one next week. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.